Why do we take space on state? Um, and it's a good question because there's no reason to be on state. Uh, um, in all my, in 25 years of growth companies in Santa Barbara, the hardest thing has been facilities planning by far because it's hard enough to plan the revenue and your expenses for the next year, nevertheless the next five, but to plan your facilities for the next 10 and most is that the size we're doing are 10 years. It's really hard. So uh, we got ourselves behind, um, almost had no space for employees. Matter of fact, we were facing 40 people with no space and we had to move quickly so, and that building was available. So that's the answer on that building. Um, so back when you were first starting Sonos, uh, Robert Herr, founder of Fuelbox, uh, local consumer electronics startup, five years running, another uh, brilliant person to get into hardware. But uh, my question, first starting Sonos, who were the most critical people that you hired to get to scale manufacturing? So when we first started Sonos, who were the most critical people to get to scale in manufacturing? Um, I'll answer a little different question than you asked, which is because uh, if you if you don't build the right product and have the right market, it doesn't matter how many you can build. Um, so that's always the place where you've got to watch. But you're like I gave you the example of the entrepreneur I've been helping who really worked with the wrong contract manufacturer, and they can't deliver on what he needs. So. That's the trick of hardware. It's any one thing that can mess the whole thing up. But but if you're gonna like apportion, a, if you had a hundred percent, if you had a pool of a hundred percent of smart people, where do you put most of it? Um, you can solve the problem of fifteen hundred only being able to build fifteen wanting five thousand because a lot of people are gonna want to. A lot of contract manufacturers are gonna want to build for you. If you build fifty thousand and you only need five thousand no one wants to work with you okay so 80 percent is on you know building the right product how to how to market it and you know how to plan that and 20 percent um now that's not to say those aren't terribly uh, uh valuable people if you look at apple um tim cook who is absolutely fantastic uh couldn't say enough good things about him he ran the parts chain. He ran the manufacturing and parts chain. So uh, that's not to say the value of those people is less than the other, but you know, he'd be the first one to tell you if you make the wrong product or you can't market it well, you know, you got bigger problems than whether you can produce enough in a sense. Um, but, but, but um, you know, at your size, I'd, I'd put a lot of time into finding the right contract manufacturer and then having a deep partnership with them. You know, don't spread your effort across three, um, and you'll have to you'll have to market to them too. When we um, when we got started at Sonos, the contract manufacturer we started with and the one we have now first turned us down. Okay, it was the d bottom of the bubble burst, and those guys got stuck with a lot of products from a lot of companies that just walked away. And you know what do they do with an unfinished product? Um, they eat it, and those guys don't have great margins. So it, some of them went under. It was a tough time. So they were pretty adverse to working with a startup. Um, so we had to do probably our toughest pitches were not on the funding side. It was on the contract bearing part because we wanted a tier one manufacturer because of course we were going to be big. Um, but they didn't want us, so uh, we worked hard on it, and it worked. Um, but but yeah, that that's so. It's a really good question. Um, hopefully, I answered it. Okay, we are coming up on one thirty, so I understand some people need to go, but we'll open it for maybe two more questions. So, get you. Hey, John, uh, Dennis Houghton. I'm with a med tech startup called GI Logic, but. Uh, my, I don't really have a question, I have a request. I was in New York, Soho, three weeks ago. You went to the Sonos store? I went to the Sonos store. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm struggling with Best Buy. I've been buying your speakers the last few months. And there's not much help there. And I'm thinking you had this beautiful location on State Street with frosted glass. 
Can you influence President Man to put in a store? I think would be a hit in, here in Santa Barbara and be good for management just to interact and see real live consumers. Yeah, I, I, I personally killed that. Um, there was some discussion. <laughs> so that's a no. So I, I can speak to that one authoritatively. Um, I think you really, I think you really have to divorce um, what you can do from what you should do. And look, if you looked at how Sonos does in Santa Barbara, if we got well everywhere, you know, it'd be it'd be one of the best known brand names on the planet. Um, so the problem isn't how we sell product in Santa Barbara. Um, and doing it in New York City, you have a lot of tourist traffic, maybe less now, I don't know, but, uh, but um, you, you know, you just have a bigger footprint. Their next store, I think they just opened in uh, London, okay? So, you know, I'd rather see them open a store in Shanghai or, or Beijing or Tokyo, um, just because these are, these are really scarce resources, um, uh, and opening the stores is no less complicated than building a new product. It's a product in and of itself, and if you underestimate it, it's a whole different learning curve. Um, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a small thing. So doing it in Santa Barbara, in in um, I understand your view, and a lot of have the same view. Hey, this is easy. It's right here. We can. Um, but boy, uh, it's in so many ways, it's so much better to not build it where you are. Because you remove all your, um, you know, your your biases and your uh, uh, what's the, um, uh, you know, when you're sure something's right and you look for all the proof of it being right, um, confirmation bias. Those are those are you know really easy to get into. Hi, John. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, my name is Aaron Campos. Um, it was an honor and pleasure working with you at Software.com. Yeah, of course, back Aaron. Today and. Uh, or everybody I know that worked there felt the same. Um, learned a lot from you. I and could there's probably give you some. Good <laughs> I'm sure there might be a few. Um, learned a lot from you, but there's two things that, that stand out to me that kind of informed a lot of my values since then. And I'm curious, A, if I've remembered these correctly, and B, if your view of them uh, may have changed in, in those years. So one of them is, I remember you coming into an all hands and just saying, this is how we win. That's hard to come. These are the deals we needed. This is how we're going to win as a company, and I felt like that just animated the the company from that point mm -hmm. until IPO. And I'm curious, like, how long did it take for you to come to that realization, and how important is that for you as a vision and other companies if they can define that? Look, if you can tell your team how to win, and it, it's it's a no. Why would you keep that? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave you guys guessing. <laughs> uh, the, the bigger trick, you know, is uh, software.com uh, hunted elephants, and I'll put it this, so, you know, the customers that we sold the product to, not who used our product, so the, if you will, our channel at software.com was the big internet providers, AT&T, uh, Comcast, Docomo, um, around the world, but there were 50 and you knew who they were. Um, so that was not a marketing problem, that was a sales problem. You had to build the right product, you had to get the timing right, but you know, if you got three people, the CEO, the person that was launching the services and on board, you were done, okay? They would buy your product, they would buy our product and launch it. And uh, as long as we didn't blow it, you were never going to get kicked out of there. There's still people that run that software, right? Um, even though the company is is you know gone for all intents and purposes. Sonos is a consumer company, and you don't get to sell to. So may maybe in the New York City store we can have people sell, but um, that's such a teeny, teeny, teeny slice of Sonos' sales. So it's a marketing problem. So you get to influence people. And that is so much harder. Um, so it's a lot harder to say, you know, to stand in front of Sonos, or it was for me, and say, if we do X, Y, and Z, we win. Now, if you do it, X, Y, and Z would be build great products, you know, make sure you're just fixated on making happy, referenceable customers. But people, that's a little hard for a lot of people to then go, okay, here's what I do tomorrow or in the next 10 minutes. And 
that was a little easier to do at software.com, believe it or not. Um, so it's different, and that's not good or bad. It's just if, if, if you can get in front of your team and tell them what to do, and it's, and it's actionable, you know, if we go win this account, another company I'm helping with uh, uh, who um, they're building a semiconductor product. And usually any kind of semiconductor product, you want to you want a pipeline of comp you want a pipeline of people that are going to use it. You want to, you know, try it in a bunch of different areas. You want a lot of diversity in your customer base. But when you're first getting started, um, in my opinion, you want to who's your design win that um, you know you're with, and they're going to use the product and be able to be referenceable. And um, and so um, sometimes you can do that. Like in, like in that example, I think the thing they struggle with is to turn off their their training of here here's the right behavior. If I worked at uh, Intel or you know. Um, Infineon or somewhere else. Uh, well, it's the same company now, but uh, Qualcomm or and turn on the behavior of let me just focus on this one customer, win them, and then grow from that. That's a completely different approach. So if you can do that, it's a great thing. Um, but a lot of times you can't. And in consumer, it's a lot harder to really clearly articulate. So there are moments when you can, but but there are moments when you have to be a little more general, if that makes sense. Hi, uh, Donald Faith, retired from databases, and I do a lot of beta testing at home, so I've got all kinds of, all kinds of gadgets. And I've wondered uh, if your apps are put through a software translator company, or do you do most of the apps there for the Android, iOS, et cetera? You mean Sonos? Yes. Are you asking about the languages, or are you asking about, um, you know, I think they've all, uh, there's a step of internationalization, which you use Unicode and other things in there, and there's localization. I think we've always followed that, and I think we use external companies to do the localization, but um, there's inevitably issues with that because someone doesn't quite understand the context or your age-old problem of for the one in China, you use a culturally, you know, inappropriate term. So you have to mix it a little, you know, internally, but use external. Um, and I don't know what they do now because I've been gone for nine months. And last question. Sam Carey, local marketing consultant. I was just curious, what's your favorite non-Sonos brand speaker and why? My favorite non-Sonos brand speaker do, do, do. Um, you know, the, uh, always canceling in ear, you know, thing that I that I really like when I fly on a plane. Um, you know, I've had the over the ear Bose ones, but after a flight to, you know, Europe or Asia, your ear hurts at the end of the day. I really like the in ear one. I don't know if that's punting and. Um, Look, I'm 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 what you see, what you get. So if there was one I loved, there, there aren't that many companies that make. Apple will be coming out with their speaker, which we watch for quite a while, and I hope they get that one right. You know, Apple quality, because uh, I think it'll be really fun. Um, uh, probably the only other company I really respect in the space is Bose because they put the time in to build. It's really hard to build a great speaker. There's so many different, um, really deep technical areas to get right. And Bose, um, we learned, I learned a lot from Bose. One of the co-founders uh, gave me a huge amount of his time at the beginning of Sonos. And I, I didn't trick him or anything. I told him what we were doing. And he knew how hard it was, so he didn't have any problem giving me a bunch of advice, because the odds of Sonos working were really low. <laughs> um, and he told me that at the time, and that was fine. Uh, I don't think he'd say that now, but uh, Sherwin Greenblatt. But he, you know, they really respect what product is. Uh, Apple does, like, you know, they just don't spit out a quick product. And I would, you know, this, look, it's a tough issue in a consumer market because you want to have a great brand, and the people that are really good at brands are people from Nike or Coca-Cola, or and they're not product companies. 
You know, Coca-Cola sells sugar water. Uh, you know, probably not very healthy sugar water. I don't know. But uh, Nike, you know, the famous conversation between Steve Jobs, co-founder Phil Knight of kill three quarters of your products because they suck and get behind the other quarter. Um, the, you know, you could take the swish off a Nike shoe and put the, you know, uh, a competitor's logo on it and no one would know. Uh, you do that on an Apple product. If you put a sticker on an, you know, an iPad or a Mac and put Microsoft on it, you'd know. Um, so those are deep product they require, and Bose is a really deep product company. I would say its marketing is terrible, which is why uh, Beats did so well. They were a terrible product company, but a really vibrant music brand. Okay. And so getting those two to meet, because they're really different cultures, is hard. You know, they generally don't respect each other. The engineers look across at the marketers and say, you know, what they do is bunk. Um, and the marketers go, oh, if you can product in six months, I could kill it. And of course you can't. Okay. Uh, so getting those two cultures that are really different to work together is, is one of the most critical elements. Apple's done it. Um, it really was in the guise of Steve and now they're really building the marketing engine, but very few companies have, if that makes sense. Well, John, this has been fascinating. Thanks for being so open and, uh, all of your time. Join me in thanking John McFarland.